En we zijn weer terug vanuit de Kromhouthallen in Amsterdam, waar we de hele dag verslag doen vanaf de Emers ID. Um, we praten de hele dag door live, maar je kunt natuurlijk als je iets gemist hebt dat terugkijken via ons YouTube kanaal. Uh, uh, en natuurlijk uh, op dit moment ook via Facebook. Um, next to me is our new guest. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Tim Leverecht. Uh, I'm a consultant and author and I wrote the book The Business Romantic and I um, spoke here this morning. So what is The Business Romantic? The Business Romantic is a, a, a new concept. So my argument is that we need more romance in our lives but also in business. Uh, especially because we're now inundated with data and I'm observing a great disenchantment, right? So I think we quantify everything, we, we reduce our lives, our lives and business in particular, to a data stream and uh, it seems to be the case that we only value what we can measure and I think that is really uh, misleading and we need to broaden the playing field again. And yeah, and still more romance, more of the inexplicable, mysterious, uh, the more uh, you know, more humanity basically, and, and bring yeah. that back into business. So that's is what I'm fighting for. Is that it? Is it more humanity? Because you see all these machines coming up and everything. So the humanity, and and, and are you afraid that we are losing our humanity? Well, I think it's it's a, it's a very interesting time, right? A very uh, uh, transformative time. So there are studies that predict that in uh, two decades from now, 50% of of uh, of workers will be replaced by software. Or robots, and already I think we're living in a very uh, algorithmic society, right? Where our, our consumer lives are dominated by companies like Amazon or Uber or others who are very much data-driven execution machines. You know, and the same is true for programmatic advertising and the media uh, industry, of course, where a lot is on-demand content farming, and a, a lot of it is algorithmic already. And you know, while I don't want to dismiss the benefits of that, I am worried that we make the mistake of uh, confusing that and, and holding it as the only objective truth and uh, so I think we need to uh, protect the space for for human error for poetry for ambiguity you know I think there's always like one that more than just one meaning and uh, as long as we do that uh, I think we're good and I think on top of that I would say because so many organizations now you know algorithmic organizations robotic organizations compete on the terms of efficiency right they're gonna be more efficient than humans will ever be granted uh, I think it's actually a huge opportunity for organizations to differentiate by being more humane, by being more imaginative, more empathetic, more uh, romantic, to use my language. I think that's actually becoming increasingly a differentiator in a, in a market that is dominated by efficiency-driven organizations. Right. So I'm a little bit of a techno-optimist, so, so uh, suppose we could just program rom romance. Do you think that would be possible? No. No? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm against it because, of course, that would violate like the very uh, essence of romance, right? which is uh, uh, that it is unpredictable. Okay. And it's surprising and mysterious, and it's a, a layer of our experience that we cannot quite comprehend and never really formalize. And I think that's also, uh, you know, in terms of business romanticism, a little bit the conundrum, right? The moment you formalize and you, you say to your organization, I want you to become all romantic and here are the key performance indicators. It's almost like a contradiction, right? You violate it. So I, I don't think, I mean, of course we will see and we're already seeing attempts where uh, robots are um, programmed to show emotions, you know, to respond to emotions and, uh, and all of that. But I think that the, the one remaining bastion of humanity is uh, is our unpredictability, right? Is, our, uh, is, is the fact that we cannot be trusted, essentially. And, and, and is it not enough for us humans to remain human and romantic? I mean, could it be not just a case that we, well, we have robots doing our labor, uh, artificial intelligence doing all the, all the difficult stuff, and then uh, uh, we can, we have all the time in the world to be romantic uh, uh, together, uh, and because we don't have to work anymore. Yeah, I think that's the argument that Singularity University and other um, apostles of, of automation are making, saying, well, you know, it's going to replace jobs that no one wanted to do anyway, and it's going to free us up to pursue more purposeful work and our passion projects. And, and I think there's some truth to that. I think in that sense, I think also, I've, I think we're seeing the beginning of a romantic era where uh, uh, work is non-work, right? So we're going to have more leisure time, more free time. Right. But the question then is, if work is no longer available to provide us with meaning and grant us a sense of identity and our role in society, exactly. what then will it be, right? So how do we integrate individuals into society? Or are we, gonna, are we becoming a, a society of, of micropreneurs, you know, all contingent on demand uh, uh, workers, you know, in the gig economy, right, who are no longer sort of sharing a social fabric, uh, a shared social contract. So I think, uh, I think that there is an opportunity there, but I think we, we have to be mindful uh, most importantly, that we ourselves are not becoming smart machines, right? So that we still appreciate things 
um, that are outside of sort of the domain of metrics, right? And I see already that with the quantified self movement uh, and this, this obsession with self optimization, right, which is very uh, prevalent in the US, right? Sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, measuring your uh, health data and everything Anything. to become a better human. Uh, I think we have to be careful that we, again, that we do not believe this is an accurate representation of our full self, right? It's one slice of it. Okay. Now, this applies to humans, but how, how does this apply to organizations? Well, organizations, uh, I hope, uh, are still to some degree going to be human, right? And I mean, I think in a sense, and that, that's the romantic speaking in me, organizations are maybe one of the most beautiful ways of organizing human resources, right? It's, it's basically about collaborating to pursue a joint mission. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, and business also uh, taking up so much time in our lives, like 70% of our waking hours we spend at work, uh, they have a huge responsibility. So granted, if they stay human, right, I think it's very, very important what they role model and the culture they create, because that's the culture increasingly that we no longer just leave at work, but that's also the culture we're going to bring home, right, and as work life becomes uh, more of an illusion. So I think they have a huge responsibility in, in creating space for uh, expressing our full self and not becoming uh, sort of an execution machine and uh, essentially just a robot at work, a human robot at work, right? right. So that's my hope, and I think the organi organizations doing that will attract... Uh, you know, talent that is about purpose, that is intrinsically motivated, and they will attract customers uh, who are attracted to that kind of human culture. Okay. And so I think they will have a, a competitive are advantage. Are they already there? Is there like a top 10 of romantic companies in the world? <laughs> so uh, I, w I wish there was a romantic index. Um, I don't think... Make one. Uh, yeah, in, in a way that defeat, it defeats the purpose, right? Sort of to, right. I don't want to introduce the romantic uh, metric. And like I a KPI. A KPI. And I... I, th I don't think there is one organization that I could easily label and say that is the quintessential romantic organization. But I think there's a lot of practices there. I mean, there are companies like, uh, I think, so there are companies that have a very romantic leader, right? So where it sits at the leadership level. I would mention Virgin. Uh, I would certainly mention uh, Elon Musk, you know, and Tesla, SpaceX. Uh, I think the, the known. I, I, thought, I thought Elon Musk was a robot by himself. <laughs> Actually, but a very romantic robot, right? Okay. Because he sees the world as it is not and he imagines different worlds. And I think there's a very romantic quest there to explore and discover. A uh, Danone, right? The yogurt, the fruit uh, nutrition mm -hmm. company in, in, uh, with uh, Emmanuel Faber, I think is a very humanist, uh, romantic leader in that sense. And then there are organizations that have, like Etsy, for example, that have romantic practices. So they have a secret society inside their organization. They have created a culture that is very, I think, tolerant of the full range of emotions of a human, uh, but not necessarily having a romantic at the top, right? So, but I think you see practices of romance, but uh, I don't think I can pinpoint like one, you know, uh, thoroughly romantic organization right. yet. So we are at a conference now that is also has to do a lot about innovation. Is there a link between romance and innovation? It's a very strong link between romance and innovation. Romantics uh, can imagine other worlds. They can imagine the impossible. They, they always see, they look, at, they look, you know, what is underneath. Is there a deeper meaning underneath? And they are fools. So think about Airbnb years ago. If you had approached an investor, and in fact they did, right, and had told them that it might become a viable business model that you'd rent out your apartment to strangers, they laughed at laughed at them, right? Uh, but it was so foolish, so outlandish, it was so romantic to actually allow strangers into your home is a very ro romantic idea uh, to begin with, that, you know, it turned out to be very disruptive. And I think that, that at least in terms of disruptive innovation, it is driven by romantics. It is driven by fools, right? Who are not content with just reacting to data and producing faster horses, right? As Henry Ford said, right. but actually thinking about like, is there something entirely new out there? Right. So, so apart from, from Elon Musk and, uh, and the other companies you mentioned before, do you see other innovations in your field of expertise or, something, uh, or things uh, that are happening right now that are very important or that are related to your romantic view? What I find very interesting is, is the whole uh, virtual reality, augmented, augmented reality technology. I mean, the, the ability to immerse into other people's lives, other environments is, is uh, basically by design a very romantic principle, right? So you have more worlds than just one. That's what the romantics always wanted. And I think there are some very, very interesting developments, particularly in the space of corporate learning and organizational change. For example, there's one startup in, in Los Angeles that is exploring uh, VR-based internships, so where you can basically commute uh, virtually to another uh, company and spend a day with, you know, say Starbucks or Airbus uh, and, and collaborate maybe on a project and experience the culture. And I think that's going to enhance a very flexible uh, 
work culture where we're no longer uh, reduced to just one professional identity. We're going to have multiple professional identities. We're probably going to be polygamous, right, in a sense of uh, our loyalties, right? We're going to work with multiple organizations. And I think that is actually very liberating and, um, and very much with the zeitgeist. And I, I, I very much look forward to where that might lead us. Well, sounds very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Dankjewel voor het kijken. We zijn hier de hele dag live vanuit de Kromhouthallen in Amsterdam waar we uitzenden uh, vanaf de Emers ID. Blijf kijken voor wie nu kijkt uh, via onze website uh, Emers en via Facebook. En voor wie uh, dit laatst terug wil kijken, je weet het, je kunt het vinden op ons YouTube kanaal.